Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak, based on a principle that family reunions and the Mount Gumgang Tourism Park should be handled separately, Seoul tells Pyongyang it needs more time before responding to its offer for talks on their suspended tourism project. Standing as a witness at a parliamentary hearing, the female spy agent suspected of being ordered to interfere in last year's presidential election denies receiving any orders. The former police investigator into the scandal admits the probe had been tampered with. Plus, a suspected militant ambush kills dozens of police officers in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. EU member countries are set to discuss cutting off aid to the North African country amid the ongoing unrest. Daybreak begins now. You're watching Daybreak on Tuesday, August 20th, and I'm Choi Yusun here in Seoul. We begin with the South Korean government's careful consideration of the North's offer for talks on the suspended Mount Kungang tourism project. Stating the tourism issue should not be linked to the resumption of family reunions, Seoul on Monday told Pyongyang it needs some time before answering to the proposal. Our Hwang Sung-hee has the details. South Korea said Monday that talks on resuming reunions for separated families and on reopening the Mount Kumgang Resort to South Korean tourists will be dealt with as two separate issues. The South Korean government will deliver our stance on the issue to the public after a thorough review of the overall situation. On Sunday, North Korea proposed to hold fresh talks this Thursday on resuming South Korean tours to the Mount Kumgang Resort, offering to discuss Seoul's concerns like ensuring personal safety and protecting South Korean properties. The resort has been closed to South Koreans since 2008, after a tourist from the South was fatally shot by a North Korean guard. And while the North accepted Seoul's offer for Red Cross talks on resuming reunions for families separated during the Korean War on Friday, the two are engaged in a tug of war on the venue of the meeting. Pyongyang has proposed to meet at the Mount Kumgang Resort, while Seoul has reiterated that the truce village of Panmunjom is the most ideal site due to the convenience of its location. And as part of efforts to reopen the jointly run Kaesong Industrial Complex, North Korea sent on Monday evening its draft proposal for the formation of a joint committee that will oversee the management of the factory zone. Seoul said it will send its own draft proposal sometime this week after reviewing the document it received from the North. Meanwhile, a South Korean communications and power inspection team made its second trip to Kaesong on Monday to check up on the facilities at the complex, which have been closed for more than four months. Hwang sang Arirang News. The first in a series of U.N. special hearings on North Korea's human rights violations will kick off in Seoul later today, Tuesday. That is, Chairman of the United Nations Commission of Inquiry, Michael Donald Kirby, is heading a panel of three experts tasked with examining Pyongyang's record on human rights. The commission will hold hearings for five days at Yonsei University, where some 30 witnesses are expected to testify about the North's human rights violations, including torture and arbitrary detention. The panel's findings will be presented at the UN General Assembly in New York in October. A final report will be submitted to the UN Human Rights Council next March. A group of current and former National Intelligence Service agents and police officers took to the witness stand on Monday over allegations the nation's spy agency meddled in last year's presidential election. Our Kim hyun has the latest on the ongoing parliamentary probe. At Monday's hearing involving NIS agents, a giant screen wall was set up so that their faces could not be seen. Behind the wall were two active and two inactive agents. A female NIS agent who stands accused of posting negative online comments about opposition presidential candidates before the December election was among them. The agent said she was only fulfilling her duties as an agent. 
I never received orders to meddle in the presidential election. I only did my duties to respond to North Korea's propaganda online. But the agent refused to answer many of the questions posed, saying she didn't want to incriminate herself in the event she's put on trial at a later date. Kwon and hee a police officer who led the investigation into the spy agency scandal at Seoul's Suso police station, said she received a phone call from former Seoul Metropolitan Police Chief Kim Yong Pan on December 16th. Kwon said that Kim told her not to file a request for a warrant to search the apartment from where the NIS agent was found to have posted sensitive political comments. What Kim Yong Pan did was unfair because it tapered with our investigation at Suso Station. Kwon said she had asked the Seoul Metropolitan Police Agency to analyze all files saved in the female NIS agent's computer, including 100 keywords. But she said the police agency cut the number down to just four and then released the results of the investigation at 11 p.m. on December 16th, just three days before the election. Other high-ranking NIS agents at the hearing said there may be posted comments online that others may have judged as being inappropriate or problematic, but they claim they only posted them to effectively counter North Korean propaganda in cyberspace. Kim hyun -ji. Arirang News. The difficulty of finding a place to live at an affordable price doesn't show any sign of easing up here in the nation, especially for renters. President Bakune on Monday renewed her commitment to tackle skyrocketing rental prices. Our presidential correspondent Oh jin -ju reports. Crazy chance prices. This is how Koreans these days are describing Korea's unique housing system of lump sum rental deposits. The country's unstable housing market has even forced people with enough money to buy their own homes outright to turn to long-term leases, pushing up the chance prices even higher. The year-on-year -year increase in chance prices of apartments in the Seoul metropolitan area has doubled since last year to 4.8 percent this year. With more of a burden on the nation's middle class, commercial banks in Korea have announced plans to raise the limit for chance loans in the coming days. However, President Park says the measures aren't enough and will not fundamentally solve the problem. During a cabinet meeting Monday morning, President Park ordered her cabinet members to work together with political parties to come up with regulations that could allow both lessors and lessees to make reasonable and predictable contracts. She vowed to put top priority on the matter during the latter half of the year. The president also promised to focus on revitalizing the economy and creating more jobs. In particular, she called on the National Assembly to quickly pass the revised Foreigner Investment Promotion Bill, which would ease regulations on foreign companies. She pointed out that more than $1.8 billion in foreign investment has been put on hold due to the delay in the passage of the bill and stressed that it would be a huge loss for the country should the foreign companies scrap their investment plans in Korea and take them to other countries instead. Oh jin Ju, Adjang News. The government has unveiled plans to tighten regulations on the use of offshore bank accounts as a means to root out shady uh, deals used for tax evasion. The finance ministry said Monday that Koreans with financial accounts abroad worth more than 1 billion won or roughly 900,000 U.S. dollars will be obligated to report their overseas assets starting next year. Those violating the new rules will be hit with a fine of 10 percent of the total assets in their overseas accounts. The plan is in line with President Park Geun-hye's pledge to uncover loopholes in the underground economy to raise tax revenue for boosting welfare. An arrest warrant has been issued for the brother-in-law of former President Chun Doo-hwan as the probe into Chun's hidden illegal assets deepens. Prosecutors deemed Yi chang Sok a flight risk for his role in allegedly transferring illegally obtained wealth to Chun's two sons. Yi was placed under detention immediately after the Seoul Central District Court granted the prosecution's arrest warrant. Chun, who became Korea's president in 1979 through a military coup, 
reportedly collected close to one billion U.S. dollars in bribes during his time in office. In 1997, the Supreme Court ruled Chun should repay close to $200 million to the state. He has since paid about $50 million and claims to be broke. Amid the, the heightened food scare about contaminated Japanese goods, Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has asked the Japanese government to provide detailed records on radioactive water leaked from its tsunami-stricken reactor. The foreign ministry says Japan promised to respond promptly. Korea's Nuclear Safety Agency and Fisheries Ministry initially made the request. The government might send a delegation to Japan if it is deemed necessary after reviewing the information. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, okay, return to the negotiation. President Park Geun Hye plan given the current circumstances. On your way to work or at home, Defense Ministry. The legislature will convene a. Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. Prime Minister Shin Do Abe said Tuesday. Turning now to the ongoing crisis in Egypt, after last week's carnage, which saw over 800 people killed, violent clashes between security forces and protesters continued on Monday. Our Song ji has the latest. The unrest on Monday resulted in casualties on both sides of the conflict. Egypt's state-run Nile TV reported Monday that armed militants killed at least 25 Egyptian soldiers execution style in the northern city of Rafa. The suspected militants ambushed too many buses carrying off-duty policemen. The incident is the latest in a series in recent days. On Sunday, police fired tear gas to free a prison guard from riding detainees. Authorities say some 600 Muslim Brotherhood detainees being transported in a truck convoy attempted to break out and held an officer hostage. Rioters say 36 were killed in the ensuing assault. The Brotherhood also canceled a planned March Sunday in Heliopolis, a suburb of Cairo, due to concerns of snipers. In the midst of all the violence, the nation's military chief, General Abdel Fattah el Sisi, vowed on state TV Sunday that the military would stand firm in the face of the rising violence, but also called for the inclusion of Islamists in the post Morsi political process. The army enforced a dawn to dusk curfew in the Egyptian capital Cairo on Sunday, with soldiers standing by in armored vehicles and manned checkpoints. More than 850 people have been killed in Egypt since security forces forcibly broke up two pro Morsi protest camps in Cairo last Wednesday. Song ji Arirang News. Staying with the ongoing turmoil in Egypt, EU foreign ministers will convene in Brussels Wednesday for an emergency meeting to find ways to broker a peaceful compromise between the army-backed interim government and supporters of deposed President Mohamed Morsi. Officials say options on the table include cutting back the EU's 6.7 billion U.S. dollar package of grants and loans promised last year and imposing an arms embargo on Cairo. Egypt suffered the bloodiest internal conflict in its modern history as the army deposed Morsi on July 3rd and over 800 people have been killed since last week. Several foreign ministers have called for a cutback or severing of aid to Cairo, but many diplomats say such a course of action would hurt the Egyptian people more than the government. WikiLeaks released a massive amount of encrypted data through its social networking since last week. The organization says it posted links to the 400 gigabytes worth of data so that they could be published later if anything happens to leading WikiLeaks figures. WikiLeaks went so far as to call the released links insurance. Although it's possible to download the files, advanced encoding prevents them from being opened. 
Finally, some good news for the thousands of or so Korean passengers who were left stranded in the Philippines after authorities there grounded all flights by budget carrier Zestair. All should be back in Korea by Tuesday evening. Specially chartered planes from Korean and the Philippine carriers flew about half of the passengers back on Monday, and the rest are expected to return to Korea by Tuesday. All Zestir flights were grounded on Friday due to several safety issues. The 2013 World Rowing Championships will kick off less than a week from now here in Korea with participants coming in from 80 countries. Our Pauli takes a look at the last minute preparations. The best rowers in the world have gathered here in the city of Chungju, southwest of Seoul. Despite the sweltering heat wave, they're focused on training to ensure their best performance at the 2013 World Rowing Championships starting on August 25th. Some 2,200 rowers from 80 national teams will be taking part in the global event, and spirits are already running high. Um, preparations, final preparations are obviously going well as in addition. Uh, we're really excited to be here, and I think that uh, we're really excited to race. This year's championships will be held at the International Tangum Lake Regatta Course under the theme Rowing the World, Clean Water for Life, Dream of Chengju. The world-class rowing course is 4,800 meters long and more than 2,200 meters wide, surrounded by amazing scenery of low mountains and dense forests. Chengju was chosen to host the eco-friendly theme competition due to its pristine environment and rich cultural heritage. Organizers have been busy making last-minute preparations, but are confident that the event will go off without a hitch. All the stadiums have been well equipped. Each operating committee has received training, and they've been assigned their duties. Due to our preparations, all that's left is to hold a successful tournament. The rowing championships will run for eight days through September 1st. Para-rowing events, cultural performances, sport exhibitions and fireworks will be featured to entertain visitors and raise awareness of rowing in Korea. Paul Yi, Arirang News. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off in the world of rhythmic gymnastics. Of course, South Korea's Sonia and Jeff finishing off the final World Cup of the season with a silver medal in hoop and a bronze in the ribbon event now has another big task. The World Rhythmic Gymnastics Championships taking place in Kiev, Ukraine. Now, it's been a rather successful season for Sonia and Jeff, who's won a total of seven medals in the five World Cup events this season, including two gold medals and a silver during the 2013 Asian Rhythmic Gymnastics Championships. Championships. But now with the World Championships taking place from September 14th to the 24th, it will be our biggest test since the 2012 London Games. Now she'll be hoping to add another medal to her tally as she hopes to finish top three in the overall scoring. And speaking of September, manager Hong Myung-bo and the South Korean national football team will have a rather busy month of September as the Tech Warriors are scheduled for two friendlies. With manager Hong Myung-bo still looking to utilize his European players for the first time since taking over the team, he'll have two chances in doing so as a friendly against Haiti was added to their September schedule. The match between the 74th ranked Haiti will take place on September 6th. Meanwhile, South Korea will also face up against the 8th ranked Croatia on the 10th at the Chunju World Cup Stadium. And moving on to the KBO, of course, no baseball on Monday night as usual. So let's take this time to take a look at the league standings so far this season. Of course, taking a look at the table here. First off, what a tight race this is with Samsung Lions barely holding on to their first place spot with LG right behind them just trailing Samsung due to the number of games played. Meanwhile, the Tucson Bears have been red hot in the month of August, just three games behind the league leader, while Nexon still in fourth place trailing Tucson by three games. 
And now taking a look at the bottom half of the league, Lotte remain in fifth place, just two and a half games behind Nexon, with the Red Hot SK Wyverns climbing up to sixth place, while the Kia Tigers continue to drop now seven games out of the playoff spot. Meanwhile, NC hoping to catch up to the Kia Tigers with Hanwha being Hanwha at ninth place. And staying in the KBO, it's probably the hottest trend in the internet since a fellow by the name of Sai started singing about what Gangnam Style is all about. It's the first pitches in the KBO games, and it all started when Clara threw out the first pitch on May 3rd. Now, no one's really sure if she's a model or an actress or what exactly she does, but those pants did all the talking when she threw out the first pitch before the Tucson LG game. And of course, this starting a wave of interesting first pitches in the league, but no one received more hits on the internet than former rhythmic gymnast Shin Su Ji on July 5th, as she does a back illusion here before throwing a heater. And of course, there was the other interesting first pitch, ballerina Elon won. Now, I can't even describe what exactly she actually did here, but they call it the butterfly pitch. Nice stretch, though. Then finally, there was Temi, who actually probably tapped all the first pitches so far. This, of course, taking place this past weekend. And what was that there? Interesting first pitch. Now, of course, we can only imagine how more fancy these first pitches will get in the future. And now moving on to some pro amateur competition results from Monday as Korea University thrashed the KT Sonic Boom 74 to 53 with Seoul SK Knights beating Incheon ET Line Elephants 66 to 54 in the quarterfinals. And of course later today Kyungi University faces off against Ulsan Mobis Phoebus with Anyang KGC taking on Sangmu the military team. Now with that said, finishing things off with the ongoing murder case involving the Blade Runner Oscar Pistorius, who is officially charged with the murder of his girlfriend Riva Steenkamp. Now what would have been Steenkamp's 30th birthday, the South African sprinter was officially indicted in the murder case that took place on Valentine's Day earlier this year. The former Paralympian and Olympian was seen crying as he received the charges. Now the court date is set for March of next year as the Blade Runner can receive 25 years if found guilty of the murder. Well, that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning, I'm Lee Ji-yeon with your latest weather forecast. What a great weather to start off a new week yesterday. It was so hot and sunny. While much of the country scorched by record-breaking heat wave yesterday, temperatures hovering 33 in the central region and down south was above 35. And even Busan hiked up to 35. Well, weather condition doesn't seem too much different from yesterday. We are expecting a lot of sunshine once again with the blistering heat. So yes, it looks like summer heat wave will continue today. Well, it's not going to be a record-breaking hot, but it's definitely above the norm. Now, the heat wave advisory has been lifted in the capital last weekend, but heat wave advisory has been reissued yesterday in Seoul and some of the surrounding areas. The daytime highs are expected to remain 33. And as we can see, the it will be the western parts of the country that will remain steamy, whereas eastern parts will stay a bit cooler. Uh, this is uh, due to a uh, cool easterly winds that blowing through and this will keep the temperatures a bit lower. So cities like Busan and Daegu should get some relief from the heat today and we'll go over the readings uh, in a moment. Now tomorrow we are expecting similar weather condition as today. I would say it will be a climax of a heat wave this year. A sunshine will be mixed with scattered clouds but from Thursday readings will start to settle down to the norm. So there should be no more blistering heat for southern provinces. Well, right now there is a thin band of clouds uh, crossing by, and so we should wake up to mostly to sunny skies because it doesn't look so bad. And sun will brighten our morning commute, so pack your sunglasses and wear a good amount of sunblocks. With that, let's take a look at today's readings. Now, the capital and Daegu will hike up to 33 degrees Celsius, that's 91 degrees Fahrenheit, but it will be a blistering day for Gwangju at 36 and Busan should be slightly cooler at 31. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju and Daejeon will hike up to 34 and 33, and Dokdo and Mount Gyeonggang will be stay, uh, slightly cooler in mid-20s. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for beers around the world.
That's all for me at this hour. Enjoy your morning commute and have a wonderful Tuesday. And those are the stories we have for you this hour. Thank you for watching.